Great to see everyone this morning. It is definitely a beautiful Lord's Day. We welcome those who are visiting with us to the Bible study hour of the Foley Church of Christ. And let me begin also by expressing uh, a happy Mother's Day to all the ladies that are here. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. Many of the things that go unnoticed as mothers, we appreciate everything that you do. Some, some, oftentimes are appreciated in retrospect instead of uh, at the moment. So we are grateful for the mothers that are here and hope that you enjoy this day, a day of remembrance. And we are needing to pray at this time for those on the prayer list as I'll read those off. Edna Wyatt, Nancy Marshall, Sue Wheeler, Audrey Peed, Audrey Racine, Lucille Watkins, Della Hill, Marcelin and Vaughn Underwood, uh, Johnny Werner, Aurelia Rogers, Rhonda Burtnett, Bonnie Wright, Juanita Chanel, Juanita Griffin, Sandy Misseldine, Maria Martin, June Deaver, Bill Wright, Roger D. Potter, Diane George, uh, Lena Smith, Amos Dean, Marnie uh, Pittijohn is not doing well, it has noted here. And also additionally in the bulletin, if you'll read, it says Ron Misseldine received a good report from an NMRI. Uh, Susie Kirby, who uh, visited a while back when she was here, uh, uh, living in the area, but she is fighting a, a staph infection in her leg. She is going to have to undergo some long-term antibiotics. And also Courtney Carlisto is recovering from surgery and is taking chemo treatments. And Norma Jernigan is requesting prayer for she is being treated with lung cancer. So there's a lot for whom we need to pray no doubt. And so um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and begin with prayer. We'll ask Brother Larry, will you lead us in that prayer this morning? Amen. Thank you, Brother Larry. Appreciate that. Uh, as you can see that our text is 2 Timothy 2.20. And um, a great book, no doubt, is the book of 2 Timothy. Remembering the background for this book as Timothy, the preacher who is receiving guidance as it seems accurately to say, a last will and testament, as I've been calling it, for the inspired Apostle Paul, how that he knows that his death is approaching and he has things to set in order and to make sure things happen and that things continue uh, in the Lord's church as far as the work. And we are uh, looking at second chapter of this book and have noticed some things that are important, of course, uh, pertaining to what the specific work was about, how we've noticed not uh, to get distracted uh, from 
what the truth is, and that's easy to do, and we've noted that in the past, and I try not to beat uh, or be like a steady, dripping, broken record or whatever uh, metaphor you'd like to put in there on some things, but we, as we deal in today's climate, uh, politically, culturally, or whatever, it's easy to get uh, caught up in things and lose focus of what, what our work is to do for the Lord. And so uh, there's a time and place for everything, as we know. And, but there's always the time and the place to preach the gospel. It's never a time that is to be set aside for something else. And we're, we've kind of looked at that. And um, we've noticed in verse 18 how that these two individuals that were named um, were ones that had been preaching the message that the resurrection had already passed. And, um, the, and how damaging and how harmful that that was for the first century church, the implications that were the result of believing that doctrine. To say that the resurrection has already passed denies a lot of the scriptural things that we know to be true and what we are waiting today. Uh, we notice 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and, and through uh, 18, how that when Christ does return, that uh, we that are Christians, that are faithful, are going to be alive, uh, are, are going to be caught up with him to meet him in the air. And uh, I don't know how you can say that that has happened yet. And uh, among other things like that, but in, their, in the views of the book of Revelation, when you study that book, you will see, and I know Brother Joel has brought this out, uh, of course, is that there are different approaches that people take to the book of Revelation. Uh, there is the futurist view, and people also see the whole Bible in a futurist view that the whole book is a prophecy of things that is yet to happen, other than maybe the life of Christ and stuff. But they'll read every prophecy as that none of it's been fulfilled. And they also read the book of Revelation like that. So we're waiting for these things to happen yet. And a lot of that's the premillennial movement. And then, of course, there is the continuous historical, and then there is the, the eclectic. Uh, but one particular view of the book of Revelation is called the Praetorist. That is that everything is already ended. Uh, and so the book of Revelation, everything was fulfilled by A.D. 70. And so we talked a little bit about that um, last Lord's Day. And then we also noted... Uh, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. One thing about true Christianity is that um, conversion is necessary. And this is a problem, uh, and it has been among those who attend churches of Christ is the true meaning of conversion. What does it mean to be converted to Christ? So many people think, well, if I attend the church gathering, then I'm a, con then I'm a, a member of that group. And they do not have the concept. And sadly to say, it stems from not preaching the distinctive truth to people who need to hear it. And so there are congregations that will gladly take on numbers without converts. And we, we, we look at this uh, very powerful passage when we go to the second chapter of Acts, this, this passage here many of you know, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And what does that mean? Well, so many things. It means, first of all, that members of a group, of a religion, do not decide who's a member of that church or not. They don't vote people in or anything like that. 
The other thing is, is that it is the Lord that adds to the church, which means what? That forgiveness of sin takes place in the mind of God. When God says sin is forgiven, that's when it is forgiven. And there are a lot of people that have this concept, well, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the Lord and I know I'm saved. Well, remember that it is up to God whether or not you have met His conditions or not. And there's only one way to do that, and that's what we're talking about here in verse 19, is that it is one is converted by the truth. There can be no confusion of that. What has happened in recent decades, but not just recent, it's been a problem all along, is that there, you know, there have, as I said before, people who have just joined the Church of Christ. And that doesn't happen. Or they, they fool, people fool themselves into thinking, oh yeah, I'm in, I'm in a good relationship with Christ because of this or that. Uh, no, you have to obey the truth, and that, as we know, is by the seed that is planted in the word of uh, being the word of God, which means the seed that is received in the heart is the word of God. It cannot be the doctrines of men. That is something that's so important. You can't just say, well, you know, I was, uh, I was baptized, or I was this, or christened, or that, and so all that was worked out with God, and, but now I, I attend the Church of Christ. It doesn't work like that. And if we could help people to see, because if you want to attend the Lord's Church, great. What's keeping you from obeying the truth? If you want to be a part of the Lord's Church, you have to do what God says, and He adds you. You know, this is greatly illustrated in Acts 19. In Acts 19, you had these disciples of John who knew only John's baptism. And they, they come to the Apostle Paul, and Paul asked them, under what baptism were you baptized? And they said, under John's baptism. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, under John's baptism, before Christ died on the cross was fine. That was the commission then. And it was baptism for the remission of sins under John's baptism. But after Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed. Baptism was preached for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. So the, John, the baptism that they had received was under John's baptism. What does that mean? They were not converts. They were disciples, and they had not been taught the truth. And so, in reading that text, Paul says, Under which baptism have you been baptized? And he said, uh, And they said unto him, John's baptism. And he said, Have you have heard of the Holy Ghost? And, he, and, and in other words, the miraculous gifts and all of that happened didn't happen under John's baptism. It happens under the baptism of Christ in the first century for the remission of sins. Then they would receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit in order for them to function as the church. So that was proof in Paul's mind that, hey, these, these guys hadn't even heard the truth. They had not even heard about the, the coming of the gifts of the Spirit upon Christians. So what did he do? He taught them the truth, and then they were not rebaptized. They were baptized for the remission of sins. They were converted. And you see, salvation always takes place under God's terms. And we have to help people see that. And literally, when you read the text, in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go make converts is what the text, not just teach, baptize, teach, you know, go make converts. We have to convert people to the truth because if they're not converted, 
The church does not grow spiritually. Yes, it may grow numerically. You may have a lot of people that attend and do all kind of activities, and they may all feel good, but as we talked about last week in Matthew 7, that warning that Jesus gave, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, that there will be many that are going to come to him in that day and say, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we not cast out devils in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Jesus is going to say these words to them in verse 23. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why? Because they were not converted. They were not added to the Lord's church. They were not taught correctly. Like Jesus said when he was in his ministry uh, upon earth. Let's see, 46 through 48. That Christianity being a taught religion, not a felt religion only. It is a taught religion. That he says, and it is written in the prophets, and they all shall be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned cometh unto the Father. We must teach the truth, no substitute, not, co not current events, not po uh, po politics or political persuasion. We have to teach the kingdom. That is what was taught in Acts, Acts 8.12 for conversion to take place. Now, let me stop here and say, that doesn't mean that a person has to be a Bible scholar in order to be converted to Christ. They want to be and need to understand that there is a kingdom in the New Testament that is, that is taught. This kingdom was the same kingdom that was preached in the first century. And this kingdom is what they want, should want to be a part of. They're not going to understand the difference between instrumental music and non instrumental all that. We're, that's, not, that's not what we're talking about. Or, you know, the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, that will come in time. But if they want to be a part of that kingdom that was preached in the first century church, that's going to make the difference. And we can't confuse people about that and... You know, what we live now in the day of, instead of denominationalism, say as it was in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s so forth, that, you know, one religious group thought that they were the only one that was going to heaven. And of course, centuries before that, and this religious group said that they were the only ones going to heaven. And this, and so on and so forth, that was denominationalism. Today we have what is known as pluralism. And it's the idea, well, we're all going in the same direction. We're just taking different paths to get there. That's not how it works. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13, after discussing the traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and how did he said, how be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? Matthew 15, 8 and 9. And they say, oh, with their lips, they're, they're close to them, but their heart is far from me. And then he goes on to say, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. What does that mean? Every plant... Every group, every so-called convert of religion is not from the word of God, shall be rooted up. And specifically, he said about the leaders of the Pharisees, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind shall lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. What does that mean? If it doesn't have the authority of God, then it is meaningless. In fact... It is against Christ. We talked about that last week. 
that Jesus says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not for me uh, scatters abroad. We're either working for Christ or we're working against him. And religion of the world works against God. It was the religious people of the day that nailed Jesus to the cross by proxy of the Roman government, but it was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious people, and we've talked about that and how that people would probably do the same thing today because they don't want the God of the Bible. They want the God that they've created in their own mind. Yes. Before he was converted and known as Saul, he thought he was doing everything exactly right. He was a knowledgeable scholar of the old law. He'd been taught, but the, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, whoever his man's name was. Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Yes, sir. And he practiced it, and so he persecuted the church, thinking that it was a foreign sect or religion. And then on the road to Damascus, things changed. The Lord appeared to him. He was blinded, told to go into Damascus there and be told him what to do. And you go to Acts 22, the start at verse 12, and you read about what happened there. All this time, he thought he had been doing right. Even when he was standing there holding the cloak of Stephen, when he was stoned. Right. So it, it shows that the conscience and what you believe won't get you there. It has to be what comes from the Lord himself, from God himself. And he had to take it and obey it. And it, it says here, when the Ananias told us, why I said, right, arise and be baptized and, clean, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He did it. Right. And from that point on, he was a great teacher and preacher of the gospel. Right. And, uh, so it, it just can't work where we get to pick and choose how we think we're going to get to heaven. Right. There's only one way. And you find out in Ephesians 4, there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All these things are there for a reason, and we have to obey. Absolutely, and it makes perfect sense when you think about it that way. You are not going to have unity, religious unity, when you've got, obviously, religious division. When people thinking, well, I've got this belief I like to do, and my family was this, and if it was good enough for them, then it should be good enough for me. No, 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 that overlooks that it is the Lord who says how one is to be saved, and when one has met that uh, criteria, that he is the one who does that. You see, yes, sir. I wanted to add that, if you don't mind, add some. You know, regarding your pluralism statement, uh, uh, what came into my head when you said that there's Matthew 7, 13. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very important passage. Yes, Matthew seven thirteen and fourteen are very, um, very important. In in that chapter of judgment, God is putting forth the stern warning. Jesus is saying, you know, that hey, narrow is the gate and straight is the way. Right? Because only few that find it. And it's not that God withholds that from everybody, right? Because we know in 1 Timothy 2, 4, He wants all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, that He is not slack concerning His promise to us, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. That's, God doesn't want anybody to perish. We know from Ezekiel 18, 31 and following, the Lord has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. So God exacts no pleasure out of the people who would die and be lost. But he also is not going to deny himself. He is not going to change who he is in order to make, uh, make uh, a leeway for some, if we know as God is no respecter of persons, right? Romans 2.11. But in here he says, narrow is the way, because broad is the way, 
and, and many there be that go in there, and that's the same many that you can drop down to verse 23 that are going to uh, approach God that day and say, Oh, but I served you all my life. And um, so those are, those are going to be the same many that are going to come to uh, God on the day of judgment. You know, the plan of salvation doesn't appear unto man miraculously. Mm -mm. It had from the get-go. Nope. We all have to be taught. Somebody has to help us uh, have our eyes, spiritually speaking, open and then become receptive to the truth. And that's the reason the nexus is upon us as disciples of Jesus Christ to go out and to teach those that need to hear. And they, that, so that they can too have their hearts and minds open and if they're receptive to it, obey and then receive the benefits of it. That's, that's our purpose now as disciples of Jesus is to go and plant that seed in the hearts and minds of men. Right. If, because usually without doing that, they'll never see it. That's exactly right. And that's why we are to preach the truth. And, you know, that's as we are going to see is the foundation is Jesus Christ. And, of course, that's the truth. And all of this is hinging upon. And like you said, this is not a miraculous thing that comes upon people because, you know, if that's the case, then it's up to God to choose the ones that he's going to save miraculously? No. It doesn't happen. God is no respecter of persons. As we know in Acts 10, 34 and 35, you know, Peter, he saw this when Apollos, I mean, uh, excuse me, Cornelius, uh, was he and his house being the first Gentile convert, a fulfillment of Isaiah 62 and following, uh, chapter 62, 2 and following, that, you know, that they, they, the Gentiles would see the way. But he being the first convert, and it's so, so powerful of a lesson there, Cornelius in his house received the ability to speak tongues. But yet, you know what? They weren't saved. And that just struck people right between the eyes when you hear him say that. Because of their misunderstanding that, you know, that God could not have any fellowship with sin or everything. Oh, no, no, no. You missed the point of what the purpose of the miraculous instance was. Because you go to Acts eleven fifteen and you see that the conversion was the same thing as it was in the Acts, the second chapter. That is the miraculous pouring out. Well, here is the proof that uh, this miraculous conversion didn't happen miraculously, is what people think that it is. No, no, no. You see, the purpose of the, the Cornelius and his house speaking in tongues is spoken in Acts 10, uh, 44. Because when they of the circumcision see that upon the house of Cornelius was poured out the Spirit, they understood that this was about. But what did Peter say? Peter said, seeing that they have received this, can any man forbid them water that they could be baptized? There's only one thing that removes sin, and it's not God the Spirit's presence. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Nothing else. Why? Because of God's plan, Leviticus 17, 11, right? That, uh, 10 and 11. That blood was given upon the altar to make an atonement for the sin. It's blood. And as we know in Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Now what does that have to do with the gifts that came upon the house of Cornelius? Nothing. They weren't saved by the gifts that they received. It was to prove to the Jews that the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. And we see in Hebrews 10 that you got the blood of the book didn't do the job. Didn't come to the old law. Right. The old law wasn't going to accomplish that. And Cornelius, though he was a good man, a just man, 
He was a person who was pursuing after Christianity, or not Christianity, but the truth and wanting to serve God. But there's only one way that that's going to happen. The truth and the blood of Jesus Christ. And we could spend so much time, and maybe should, about, you know, where the location of the saved being the church and why? Because that is where the blood flows, is upon the church that was purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. The church meaning the saved. The Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. You see, this does go back to verse 19, and I know we hadn't hit verse 20 yet. I was just trying to move on, but brethren and friends, this is such a powerful point. You don't need to leave this until we've got an understanding, and I'm not saying you don't, but uh, until we can... It oozes from us that we understand this concept because in the Lord's church, and I, I, and, I, and I don't even say that, I say that in a loose sense, you have had people who have not been converted to Christ. Oh, well, we just accept their baptism is what's been someone has said. Well, they were baptized in this denomination. Well, it was for the remission of sins. That doesn't matter. You, you know, no, no. Repentance precedes baptism. And if someone continues in this religious organization, they haven't repented. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2.38. And you've had people who I know personally who have been selected as deacons who were never converted to Christ. Whether or not they ever made it an elder or whatever, I don't know, because of the false doctrine of rebaptism that took place primarily in the 1980s, but even before that, J.D. Tent and also David Lipscomb battled over this issue. And I'll say this, as great as a man as David Lipscomb was and the great things that he did, he was dead wrong on it. We don't accept anybody's baptism. It's not up to us. Just like we, the church, has no authority for anything. The church has no authority. We only have delegated authority by Christ. We are the result of the doctrine of Christ. We don't determine the doctrine of Christ. If we can help people see that, you know, it helps us as individually as we talked about last Sunday, you know, so-and-so died, they're lost. It's not because I said so. I don't have a say-so in the matter. No, no family member has a say-so in that matter. And I don't have to feel guilty, as, even though we could feel sad. For that, when that person dies lost, it's not because the Church of Christ says so. And that's something that maybe I haven't, I had just hadn't done the better job. You know, I just understood and I was embarrassed because of, I don't know what to tell somebody at the time or whatever the case may be. I don't have a say so in the matter. Now, there's still judgment that we have to use uh, in when we're, when, when we're comforting the, those who have lost a loved one and all of that. But it's not just that. You, but we apply that particular principle to religious groups. You know, the gospel is for all. But in order to meet God at His terms, you must give up man-made religion. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. No, no debate to be said about that. Because God has laid down that law. We always have to meet God on His conditions. Because here in verse 20, finally... But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood of, and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be an honor unto vessel, sanctified, or excuse me, a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. He is talking about there are those who do not act like converts of Christ. 
And I think a great parable of this is right here in Luke 8. The parable of the sower. Or some as know as parable of the soils. We remember that the seed is the word of God. And how that in the hardened path versus the stony ground versus the thorny ground versus the good soil. The verse 1, as we know, Jesus defines the parable as the Satan. Uh, it's, the, the heart is so hard that the, the word, the seed, does not penetrate. And so they, uh, the, the devil uh, and the, has taken the word away, Mark 4, 14 and following. And then, of course, you had the stony ground. And this would be more similar to what we're talking about here. Those who gladly receive the word and they're just on fire, but they really have no grounding. They really haven't counted the cost of Christianity. And of course, because of persecution for the word's sake, persecution for the word's sake, that being the, the sun scorching it, they wither away and die. They, they betray Christ. And of course, the stony ground, or the thorny ground rather, is the ones that those who are members of the church, we always have to watch out for this, is because, you know, it says the cares of this world, the lust of other things, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And as Luke says, they bring no fruit unto perfection. Or they bring no fruit. There are those, as you can see, that are gold and silver and precious in their very uh, uh, diligent in what they do for Christ. And then there are those who are earthen vessels and those who are made out of wood that are not so strong. And one commentator put it this way, I, you know, I think it was a good way, that in the church, as he defines it, there are those members that are wholly converted to Christ, and then there are those who are just not, or they're just sitting there filling the pews or whatever it may be. And so they're not productive. There's not much value to their Christian life in terms of what the effort that they put into it. There's one more passage I want us to look at is 1 John 2. Because of the problem with Gnosticism, in verse 19 specifically, the problem with the Gnostics is that they were leading people away because of their popular doctrine with the Grecian uh, mysticism that was prevalent at the time. And they had mixed that with Christianity and all of that in their mind, saying, well, there's no way that Christ would have come in the flesh since all you know, matter is evil and so forth. Uh, but here, as we see here, uh, well, let's just read verse 18 because that's what it's talking about. Little children, it is, it is the last time. I mean, when it says it's the last time, there is no other dispensation that's going to come. So the idea of a rapture and all of that and the premillennial view of an antichrist and all of that, no. In the first century, it is the last time. Okay, so interesting note there. As ye have heard that an antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists. Okay? whereby we know that it is the last time. You, know, see, you see why people get confused about, well, the resurrection, the praetorist point of view, and they'll go to passages like this to say, oh, it's already fulfilled. No. The Antichrist is defined, and whatever an Antichrist, or whoever an Antichrist uh, is, is defined in 1 John 4, 1 and 2. I mean, there is no confusion about that. Uh, but I don't want to get, because when it comes to conversion, verse 19 is where I want to go. They went out from among us, or from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, 
they no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. What is that saying? These people left because they were really never converted. Because if they were converted, they would have stayed put and taught the truth and did what God said. But they left that it might be made known that they weren't of us. If you're not converted to Christ and to Christianity, ultimately you're going to leave. And that's what it says here. And kind of what we've been hitting on back at 2 Timothy about the, the caliber of a convert. Because the Lord knoweth them that are His. Remember, He says, I never knew you. The Lord knoweth them that are His, verse 19. That's the seal. That's the foundation that is built upon Christ. And so... If a man therefore, verse 21, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. You know, the Lord's church, the elders specifically, have the work of stopping the mouths of those who would cause division, who would lead people away from the truth. And so, in this you can make an application of personal things that come out of your life, areas of growth where we need to grow out of you know, certain issues that we may have trouble. Because if you see verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, and charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart personal application of things that we need uh, you know, to change in our lives because none of us are sinlessly perfect. There's no such thing, 1 John 1, 7 through 10. Uh, we, uh, we, we understand that we walk in the light as He is in the light, and so we understand that. But in John 15, and I, I know I use this Illust well, this illustration, our point a lot because it's so comforting. John 15, we can look there and we will see how, you know, this parable that Jesus gives is, it, it, it just, it teaches such with clarity as the Lord chose the words that would do so. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. We talked about foundations. Jesus is the only true foundation. He's the only true vine. And in this, He says, my Father is the husbandman. Now, notice, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, He taketh away. That's the person that would be converted... But yet, like the stony ground, or a person who quits on Christianity, that's the person who doesn't bear fruit. He takes away. And every branch in me or, uh, that beareth fruit, rather, verse 2, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. I have used, and I think that it is clear. This is the best explanation of grace that God understands that there are things that we're going to be working through. And, and, and here, the branch that is trying, the branch that is striving, the branch that is doing what it can, God purges this fruit, or this, this branch rather. He purges it. it is, God is not looking for us to be lost. He's not, well, they got it wrong, boom, they're out of, out of, I'm done with them. That's not our God. He wants all men to be saved. And for those of us who are working, and not, and not, not in the sense of earning, I mean putting the, 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 the fruit forth in our lives, 
that we are making the effort of Christianity, God purges. He helps us to grow. And we know what that does. Yes, sir, brother. He's pruning it. Right. That's so, isn't that, isn't that such a simple and powerful lesson that Jesus used about what happens if those things stay in our lives? They become a canker. And we'll see that's back in 2 Timothy. That word canker is used uh, by, by Paul. But yeah, you see, we have those things in our lives that uh, we need to grow out of. Evil companions corrupt good morals. You know, Christianity is a journey. It is a race. It is not a, or as someone said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so as a result of that, as a result of that, God works. But now he says here, verse uh, 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word of God does that. Now he, Jesus, goes on and says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. We have no authority nor power as the Lord's church to do anything without him. There's, we don't determine anything. I am the vine, ye are the branches. So here is the understanding that when one is converted to Christ, he is a branch. And this is not talking about pluralism. This is not talking about denominationalism, where different branches hanging off the one true vine. Mm -mm. Only the seed produces the true vine, right? And a branch. And so we understand here by this definition, verse 6, if a man... Verse 6 says, if a man abide not in me. It's not denominational group. So, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit, and without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Where is once saved, always saved in this? Impossible. Calvinism's doctrine is destroyed many times in the Bible, and this is one of the clear examples of that. We have to be productive in the Lord's church. We have to bear fruit. That doesn't mean that we have to be tirelessly every day going out and handling, uh, handing out uh, pamphlets and all of this and having Bible studies. Those are great things we should be doing. But God is not. He, remember, He wants us to go to heaven. He's, he, he is not trying to discourage us. That's not what God does. He's doing everything He can to encourage us and give us hope. And that's what this passage does. This, hope, this passage rather gives us hope and that we know that even though we're not sinlessly perfect, God is working with us that we would grow and help others to become Christ. Now back to 2 Timothy 2. We find in this passage here, flee, verse 22, also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Like Brother Sewell said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil companions corrupt good morals or good manners. That was used in 1 Corinthians context of those who are going around and saying there is no resurrection. And so if you're going to befriend people like that and have things in common, you're going to be in trouble. Because like the prophet said back in Amos 3, 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? And so you can't have agreement with those who are going to teach that kind of stuff. And the same thing here. You want to join yourself to those who are pursuing what's good and what's right. 
Now, that doesn't mean we're better than anybody. That's important. No one's better than anybody. But we choose to who our friends are to be.